So uh, everybody who's here in person, thanks for being here in person. You know who I am. Uh, and I'll introduce our uh, keynote speaker for this inaugural session of the Dean's Leadership Lecture Series that we do every year in the School of Health Sciences and Practice here at New York Medical College. It's a real privilege to introduce a true friend of our school, a member of our adjunct faculty, uh, and someone who has been a true healthcare leader here in New York. Michael D. Israel is president and CEO of the Westchester Medical Center Health Network, also known as WMC Health. With its flagship right across the driveway, the 1700 bed regional medical system serves New York's Hudson Valley and beyond encompassing a regional academic medical center, a children's hospital, trauma centers, several other hospitals, behavioral health centers, inpatient and outpatient, nursing homes, home care, and numerous outpatient health services and related functions. It also plays a major role in educating countless numbers of our students, present and future. Well, Mr. Israel and I both came here in 2005 when Westchester Medical Center was financially stressed to the max. The governor had just appointed me to chair the Burger Commission Regional Council for the Hudson Valley. And actually there were rumblings that the state might withdraw its life support from the medical center and let it fail. Michael met with the council in person for about two hours and got lots of tough questions. In plain English, he cut through the confusion and patiently laid out his turnaround plan. His testimony that morning led to the council's strongest recommendation of support, as well as politically critical endorsement by other county governments in the Hudson Valley. Some of those counties even offered a sales tax increase if that would help save the medical center. It's a long time ago, and yet it's not a very long time ago, but that's, that was really happening in 2005, 2006, and the next couple of years. Well, we all know the rest of the story. Mr. Israel turned it all around, way beyond everyone's expectations. From deep losses to substantial financial strength with enviable advances in quality care for the most serious cases. Accessibility for more than 300,000 children and adults annually with a workforce of 13,000 today. And an economic regional contribution of, hold on to your seats, $3.3 billion. That's astounding for an institution that was almost on life support just a few years ago. Mr. Israel has more than 40 years of experience in healthcare administration and a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. We've shared some parallel tracks along the way. Both of us were educated at Rutgers and we were both supported by the US Public Health Service during our education. And although his fellowship was actually at Yale, he did marry a woman from Dartmouth. So we're practically related, or at least in-laws. His previous leadership roles include CEO of Duke University Hospital, Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs there, and COO of the entire North Shore Long Island Jewish Health System, and Executive Vice President of St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital, Texas Heart Institute in Houston. We are so proud to include Michael Israel as a member of our medicine and public health faculty at New York Medical College. And those of us in attendance, let's show him a warm and hospitable NYMC welcome. Wow. Very nice, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hambler. Much appreciated. Okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's good. 
Josh knows how this works. If you want the slides to work appropriately. Um, so we're, we're going to do, uh, Josh and I are going to do a presentation today about uh, what transpired uh, with the pandemic, how we reacted to it, and how we're planning and what we're doing about it going forward, because I think uh, the reality that everybody has uh, come to grips with is that uh, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be a while before we become non a, a, in a non-pandemic state. And I think the reality is who knows, who knows what's next and we have to prepare for it. And, you know, I think the, I, I think one of the points is in, in terms of growing up, uh, my, my master's degree is in public health, uh, but with a, uh, um, with a concentration in hospital administration. So from, from graduate school, this is what, this is what I wanted to do and was uh, uh, lucky enough to be able to, uh, uh, to continue my career here. But I will tell you going, going, uh, uh, going from the very beginning, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that hospitals practice. Uh, you have um, disaster drills. You practice what happens if an apartment building burns down. What happens if a plane crashes? If you happen to be near near water, boat accidents, this or that. You can't practice a pandemic, and no one, no one at at the very beginning had a to to be blunt, really had a clue as to what this was going to entail. I will tell you that I was in some of the very early meetings uh, with the governor. Uh, I had the ability to sit on the uh, uh, to sit on the dais a couple times at those uh, twelve o'clock press conferences, uh, and it was great because I knew it'd be. I remember my wife calling me and saying, "I got a call from my cousin in San Antonio. She saw you on TV." I said, "Hey, that's really neat." And you know you were going to be up there, and even if the press addressed a question to you, the governor would answer it. So uh, it was like it was like a no pressure situation. But but the reality is the the information that was coming to the state behind the scenes was so varied on a day to day basis by the quote unquote experts. So from from our perspective, as this started, we said, okay. What we have to do is we have to create a unit in the hospital to take care of COVID patients. And we thought we were so ahead of the curve. We had uh, just moved endoscopy and we created to handle COVID a six bed COVID unit. <laughs> and we thought we were so smart. It took a couple of a couple of weeks to disavow us of uh, of that belief, but that's really what happened. So, you know, a lot of this, well, in fact, all of this was really done on the fly. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted Josh here was because uh, you've got people like me who try to direct, and you've got people like Josh who one day hopes to be uh, one who directs. But Josh, Josh and his people do. And that's what's that's what's so important. And Josh is going to not only not only show you and tell you what we what we did and how we addressed it uh, in more detail than I'm going to go into, uh, but the reality is he can answer he can answer questions if there are questions that come in. So to begin with, um, talking about leading COVID nineteen uh, care in the Hudson Valley. Uh, we, WMC Health is the leading COVID-19 uh, response uh, for the Hudson Valley. We led it on a number of fronts. Uh, patient care for COVID-19 positive patients, we did that across acuity levels. Uh, acute, inpatient, outpatient, longer term, other programs. Testing. Um, that included both COVID-19 diagnostic tests and antibody tests. Uh, Josh will give some numbers. Uh, we are in excess of uh, locally 300,000 uh, uh, diagnostic tests and about 20,000 20, antibody tests. Uh, a number 
of specialized COVID-19 programs, uh, including post-COVID-19 recovery programs. Um, we have cared for just under 500 post-COVID patients who have needed it in these programs and the worksite uh, wellness programs that we have. Vaccinations. Uh, we operated in three distinct categories. Uh, we were, I, I will say, proud that when uh, the state broke the state into regions or quadrants or whatever, uh, he specifically asked the two organizations uh, run those. On Long Island, it was Northwell, and in the Hudson Valley, it was uh, Westchester that he wanted us to do it. Um, and uh, we administered vaccines uh, on our campus and to our workforce. Uh, we ran the Hudson Valley Regional Vaccination Hub. Uh, and uh, we also ran the mass vaccination sites in the area. And, you know, when you take a look at how we progressed, I remember the first shipment of uh, the first shipment of vaccine of vaccines. I got a call on a Saturday night. Uh, from somebody on the, uh, at the state, along with somebody from the state police, that they were shipping the vaccine to us. And a, a, a 50, one of the 52 foot, 54 foot, whatever they are, tractor trailer trucks came with state police escort on both sides, backed into the loading dock. And as I'm told, it went up and there was one pallet in there with the, with the vaccine. You know, everybody afraid that the people were gonna to try to hijack the truck and this and that. So again, you see how things change really kind of crazy. As of December 21st of uh, last year, uh, we had handled almost 300,000 calls about COVID, about getting the vaccine, about all of that. So you take a look at the infrastructure that you have to put in place to handle 300,000 calls. Uh, the number of diagnostic and antibody tests administered between the two, about 325,000. Uh, the number of post-COVID uh, post recovery patients care for, almost 500. And the number of vaccinations handled, which is 100% of the workforce of, of Exclu uh, excluding those with medical exemptions, which are not, not a lot, um, about 650,000. All right. So uh, our, our, our response to COVID-19 in the timeline. Um, in March, we'll enter the third year of of dealing with COVID and, and our response. The first case was confirmed on March 1st of 2020. Um, the timeline that you're looking at delineates the COVID-19 experience and the five phases uh, that we'll reference throughout the presentation. I'll do the first phase, Josh will do uh, phase two through five, I hope. Good, okay. Very good, thank you. Uh, phase one, the case surge and the pandemic peak. Phase two, the post-peak case deceleration. Phase three, public vaccine distribution. Phase four, maximizing public immunity. And phase five, current environment and ongoing pandemic planning. And I guess I'll pick up in, uh, in that. At the next. So phase one, case surge and pandemic peak. March 2020, as I said, first patient. March 7th, New York State declared uh, a disaster, uh, the, their emergency disaster declaration. Mid-March, they stopped elective admissions and outpatient services were canceled. Now I'll say, and you'll hear about it, that put an enormous, this whole thing obviously put an enormous financial stress on, on hospitals for any number of reasons that you'll hear about. 
but it was interesting from the point of view, and I'll talk about it in a minute. We really ran two hospitals. In each of our hospitals, we ran two different hospitals. But if you look at, look at Valhalla, in essence, under one roof, you had a COVID hospital and a non-COVID hospital. And the interesting thing was, at the beginning, people were afraid to come into the hospital. They couldn't come in for electives. They couldn't come in for outpatient, but they didn't want to use the emergency rooms. The emergency rooms dropped way off, except for people who thought they had COVID and were coming in. And from an inpatient perspective, you had a situation where the quote unquote COVID hospital was full because what you kept doing was you kept taking additional units and converting them into COVID units. Nobody wanted to come in who was not critical in terms of utilizing the hospital. So the fact is you had a very full COVID operation and you had basically an empty non-COVID operation. So believe it or not, with everything that went on and everything you heard out there, you had plenty of, you had plenty of capacity in the hospital. It was just the patients that were in, especially at the beginning, when they really didn't understand how to treat when they thought it was a pulmonary disease. It wasn't, a, it was a vascular disease. And they did not, they did not understand that. But when they finally understood it, you had a situation where you had a lot of capacity and no capacity. And that was, that was very difficult from a financial perspective and something you should remember. March 27th, COVID-19 infection testing begins. April 22nd, antibody testing began. And uh, our, our actual peak was around April 8th. So five to six weeks after the first patient, uh, we, really, we really peaked. Next slide. Okay. Um, so we, we we responded to the first surge in through five key functions. Number one, we took a look at the clinical staffing model and we had to optimize that. Um, we deployed physicians, residents, we reactivated clinic staff from different areas, asked early retirees to come back. There were a number of things that were done, but what we needed to do is we needed to ensure that we had we had the appropriate staff to treat the patients, most important. Uh, we expanded access for COVID-19 patients. Uh, we, we increased our beds by 50%. And uh, just an example of, of how that happened. The new ambulatory care facility that was opened up a few years ago. On the second floor of the facility, there's a very large ambulatory surgery center. We have 38 bays, recovery bays. And they're not the old bays that one would consider, you know, with curtains on three sides. They're hard walled mini rooms just without, without the front door with room for family and everything. So they're actually quite large. We turned that overnight into a non-COVID ICU and relocated our non-COVID ICU patients out of the main tower and into the ambulatory care center. And we had that going for a number of weeks. So there were a whole bunch of things. We showed at one point in time, I remember we showed our board uh, and it was actually a little video of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the main tower and the colors kept changing in terms of one day, this was a COVID unit, uh, excuse me, a non-COVID unit. The next day it was a COVID unit. A week and a half later, it was a non-COVID unit. How things moved back and forth and how we were able to handle it. We centralized operations. We set up a, a central call center. And I said, there were hundreds of thousands of calls that we had to take care of uh, for testing, for vaccine appointments, et cetera. We updated our visitation policies also, and we're back to some extent of, 
uh, of, a, of a bit of that in terms of limitations on visitation, which quite frankly uh, is, uh, you know, you've got to balance uh, what the, you've got to balance what the patient needs and what family needs versus allowing the staff to be able to do their jobs. And, uh, but that, that has worked out quite well. Uh, clinical communication and care communication, uh, we just work very closely. Our head of, uh, our head epidemiologist, uh, physician, Don Chen, uh, in infectious disease, we moved him upstairs. He became a member of the management team. He's still upstairs with us, uh, in the main offices and everybody met every morning and it's like, okay, what's today going to bring, et cetera, what are the plans? And, uh, we leveraged, uh, our e-health center. Uh, we have a very, very robust uh, e-health center. It was set up, uh, set up uh, probably what four or five years ago. Uh, there's an organization that ranks them. Uh, we've been ranked uh, between one and three in terms of the best centers in the country. Uh, it's really an absolutely terrific center, and we use that to be able to leverage care not only here but throughout the network. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, if, if we could, if, if that uh, had the ability to, to move through, this was actually the, uh, this was actually what we showed the board, but we showed them day by day what existed where, and it was really quite, in, quite interesting. Um, so as I talked about it, two hospitals under one roof, a COVID hospital and a non-COVID hospital. We increased bed capacity by 50 by 50% utilizing areas that were not being utilized for, uh, for beds, stopping all renovations, et cetera. Every, every physical space that we could put a unit and staff it appropriately, we did. Um, starting March 12th, um, as I talked about a little earlier, we segregated the uh, COVID and non-COVID care and uh, uh, did a, a lot of work developing strict protocols for patient safety and uh, quite frankly, staff safety. Next. Um, the critical supply surge. Uh, I'm sure all of you remember who uh, uh, some uh, pictures that were in some of the uh, New York City uh, newspapers of staff at uh, some hospitals wearing garbage bags and uh, all kinds of things. Our folks, a combination of two things, Anthony Costello, who is uh, uh, one of our executive VPs for operations, he's chief operating officer of, uh, of the hospital up here. And um, uh, Anthony has supply chain reporting to him and very, very, very early in the process, he started to acquire uh, uh, every, every bit of PPE he can get in. Uh, there was PPE that came in unsolicited from companies, which was really great. And one Saturday at the very beginning, I think I had something like 23 phone calls from uh, uh, Amy Paulson, who is uh, uh, one of our assembly, uh, uh, one of our assembly members who just kept calling. Uh, call so and so, so and so, so and so can get you has a connection here and can get you PPE. But the bottom line is again, when you talk about finances, again, most important thing going to the 90 day supply of PPE, which was mandated, we went from a pre pandemic PPE annual expense in terms of mass, in terms of gowns, et cetera, of 1.9 million to 5.1 million. And remember, that's not, you know, not at peak levels that we hit the peak and then went down and we've, we've been in these, but again, the PPE has to be there. So with that, we're going to take a look at, uh, we're going to go off to phase two and uh, Josh will, uh, Josh will take over for now. Josh, will you allow me a quick introduction to you? It's not necessary. Not necessary, but it's, but it's called for. <laughs> so it's my privilege to next introduce Josh Ratner, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of the Westchester Medical Center Health Network, again, WMC Health. Now, Josh and I have been regular Zoomers uh, 
speaking to the business community and the public as implementation of COVID protective uh, measures and treatment has become more and more complex. Josh is responsible for developing clinical and corporate strategies across the 10 hospitals that comprise WMC Health and for identifying and disseminating new inf innovation in healthcare. In this role, he oversees relationships with the network affiliates and provides strategic and operational oversight to the behavioral health programs. Josh leads New York's operational vaccination hub for the entire Hudson Valley region. In this regard, we and our families, friends, and coworkers owe him great, great thanks. Josh also serves on the boards of WMC Health's Bond Secure Charity Health System and the Health Alliance of the Hudson Valley. Josh also has an MPH in health policy and management. And although he earned that one at NYU, uh, do I see a new member of our NYMC faculty in the making? I think I do. I think I see a winner. Those of us in attendance, please join me in showing Mr. Josh Ratner how warm and hospitable we are here at New York Medical College. Hands together. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to continue down memory lane as we think about where we've come from and where we're going. So uh, phase two, if you think about it, because the years all sort of merge into one another, we're talking about effectively two summers ago, right? When you start thinking about, oh, wow, was it really that long ago? So, so two summers ago was when we, we took a look at what was occurring and you realize that during that time frame, we did see a sharp decline in COVID cases. And so I think everybody was looking at it, hoping optimistically that we had seen the worst of it behind us. When you take a look at the numbers, and we're going to talk about this a little further, but this time frame, this phase two time frame, is really that blue rectangle, that blue square, if you will, in the middle, right? Coming out of the this is this is WMC's numbers, COVID numbers. So coming out of that peak, as Mike talked about earlier on April eighth, and looking at that sharp decline, and everybody going rah rah, okay, we've we've sort of gotten the worst behind us, and thinking about where we were headed. Um, only to have realized that as you see the, the, the next two waves coming at us, um, sort of the learning exp experiences that we had through each of those. Um, and I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about this afternoon is really understanding what these numbers mean, how many are symptomatic versus non-symptomatic, what are we going to measure moving forward, but and snapshot really this is where we were in phase two when we looked at this, uh, this next phase of our, our pandemic. Phase three is really where the activity again starts to pick up quite a bit. Um, Mike mentioned it, but if you think about it, right? So December 14th, there was the first dose of vaccine that was distributed to healthcare workers. And if everybody remembers December 15th, we had a fairly significant nor'easter with three days worth of snow. So what was interesting at this time frame was you had sort of this operation that was going on within the hospital. At the same time, you had a group, a small group uh, of, of folks internally who we were working with to put together a vaccine distribution plan. And at the same time as we were doing that, we also were actively taking care of our staff to begin vaccinating staff. So it was really a multifaceted operation at that point where we had really three distinct things going on at one point. Um, and so that picks up where effectively on December 16th, the governor at the time, Andrew Cuomo, had designated and div divided up the state into 10 regions. Each of those regions had a single uh, lead. We were designated as the lead for the Hudson Valley. And the goal was really to put together a vaccine plan that involved community um, engagement, working with our departments of health, working with uh, regional stakeholders and making sure that there is a fast, fair and equitable distribution of vaccine. Um, and as, as Mike mentioned, mentioned earlier, who knew what a vaccine plan looked like on you know, December 7th, 
eighth, ninth, tenth. So we were actively working during this time frame to put together a vaccine plan to address how we were going to set up pods and how we were going to begin to address this. Here is a, here's a basic set of infrastructure that was set up. Um, and it was really a multi-pronged approach. Um, on one hand, we were looking at a regional task force. And within that regional task force, we had effectively two groups. We had a provider work group that included all potential providers who were going to actually administer vaccine. We had a county subcommittee, and by county, I mean counties. So each, and we're, we're, we're fortunate to have our own Dr. Amler here this, this afternoon, but each of our county executives and their county health department leads, as well as some others were represented there. On the right side of the page, you'll note that we had um, developed a health equity task force. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this, in this presentation. Um, and then effectively, we had a project management office. And that project management office was responsible for the operations and logistics, which included coordination of, of, of vaccine itself, looking at the, um, the allocations, communicating those allocations, um, looking at reallocations. So if you remember early on, no vaccine could move anywhere without a whole host of forms that included, sometimes it felt like an act of God so that you could move from point A to point B, but it was substantial in order to actually do that. We also had um, the communications element where we were trying to work with community-based organizations and, and others to help understand how each day, basically, in some instances hourly, as state vaccine guidance was distributed and handed out, how do we make sure that the community at large understood who was eligible, where they were eligible, what was the eligible criteria, and how do providers make sure that they're up to date with those? So that is effectively what the plan looked at. From a coordination perspective, here are some of the numbers. Um, I think as an organization, we're extraordinarily proud of over 500 members and five active stakeholder groups that participated in these hub activities. Um, and you'll see there, I won't take you through each of them, but one of the things that we found was, at least in my career, this was the first time I had ever seen all of our area hospitals and health systems come together, put those competitive forces at, off to the side, and really work together to make sure that the community um, was able to receive and have access to vaccine as quickly and as fair as equitable as possible. And I think through the course of all of that, through months and months of vaccine distribution, our hub was very proud of the fact that no vaccine dose ever got wasted. And we were very fortunate from that perspective. A key element to understanding how vaccine was effectively being distributed was data analytics. Um, and working internally with our team of, of data scientists, what we began to do was take the state data that, and this is a sample by the way, this sample is from June of 21. But what we did is we looked at zip code level uh, population data and vaccine administration data. So we could understand based on based on where patients, or I should say where the community lives, who had received the vaccine dose and who, and effectively where were those lagging zip codes. So as we stood up our health equity task force on a weekly basis, when we pulled our providers together in our health equity task force, what we were looking at is, you know, where are those communities that are not receiving, you know, where are those communities that need additional vaccine and how do we get it out to them? And so in this instance, what you're looking at is this map reflects the top 30 zip codes with the lowest vaccine administration rates for that particular week. And so we would then engage with providers, if it was Sullivan County, if it was Orange County, if it was Westchester County. And interestingly enough, from a public health perspective, they looked very different. So in Sullivan County, as you can imagine, a much more rural community, there was issues with, with transportation and access. That's very different than Poughkeepsie, where we started to see lagging vaccine administration rates, even though necessarily transportation wasn't the issue. It was really more around, you know, helping folks with, with, with vaccine hesitancy and then later on vaccine, dec, you know, declination. But so the Health Equity Task Force really helped us understand some of these issues and try to work with the providers to ensure that no community was left behind. Um, in addition to that, as, as, um, as Mike mentioned earlier, 
we are extraordinarily fortunate and proud that there were four mass vaccination sites in the Hudson Valley. One at the county center here in Westchester, uh, the Ulster County Fairgrounds in New Paltz, um, SUNY Orange, as well as Rockland Community College. In each four, we were the vaccine provider uh, partnering with the state and the counties. So you'll see some of the numbers there that are, that are up to date. Um, this is one of those particular areas where if you think about it, uh, let's just use the county center. I happened to look at the date this morning. Tomorrow will be one year. And January 13th is when we stood up the county center of, of last year. So you think about where we have come in a year. It is extraordinary. And the number of doses that we've administered. Now we've, we've since transitioned that county center to Valhalla campus and we are administering there. I know the county is also gonna be administering at the county center as well. So more the merrier. But when you think about the numbers, right? So effectively between what we've administered to each of those facilities, just you know, 560,000 some odd doses, um, an extraordinary amount of, of vaccine. Um, from, a, from a vaccine distribution perspective, one of the things that we found was that we were going to have to coordinate with the county health departments and the state department of health to administer in pop-up vaccine sites. And those pop-up vaccine sites took on different, different shapes and sizes throughout the time frame that we were working. Uh, you'll see some pictures there where in some instances uh, we were doing them right there on the street. Uh, in other instances, we were doing them in churches or houses of worship. And at the very top there, what you'll see is um, that we actually partnered to do it in train stations. Um, sometimes the weather participated and worked out nicely and in other instances, the weather did not. So I remember, I think it was over, um, I wanna say maybe Memorial Day weekend where we had staff set up in a park in the pouring rain under tents for an entire weekend. And we had maybe six people show up for vaccine. So it certainly wasn't for a lack of trying. Uh, and we have an extraordinarily dedicated set of clinical and operations teams who did all of the work here that we're presenting this afternoon. So just, uh, I just wanna acknowledge that as we, as we continue to progress through this. From a health equity and community engagement perspective, um, a, a special shout out to Dr. Mill Etienne, who was the chair of the Health Equity Task Force. Um, we made huge inroads um, in being able to work on health literacy, in focusing on how to remove barriers, uh, how to provide outreach and education, call hotlines. We were doing everything we could on a weekly basis to target every particular community that we could um, and again, very early on, it was more about health, it was more about, I think, vaccine hesitancy. As we got further into this, it became less about that and more just about folks just not feeling comfortable and, you know, declining overall. Uh, I think as you'll see the numbers that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, uh, we are quite fortunate here in the Hudson Valley and even in New York State in terms of the total vaccination numbers. But, you know, whether it's the 5,000 COVID vaccine related calls that we answered with partnership with 211, or some of the other examples that you see there up on the, on the screen, I won't take you through each of those, but that health equity task force made a big impact for, for us and for the entire Hudson Valley. And, and that takes us through really um, up until phase four. And that's where we are um, in this particular point in the presentation. To, to refresh your memory, if you look at the dates up on the screen, starting in May, right? So now, now we're looking at uh, this past summer, May of 20, you know, 2021. Uh, children ages 12 to 15 became approved for vaccine. We now had a new variant. It was the Delta variant, feels like ages ago, right? Uh, we had a new variant and that became the dominant strand. Um, we had an emergency approval for five to 11 year olds and boosters were becoming a, an item that was quickly becoming something that we were beginning to ramp up for that as well. So it's, I think I, I found it interesting as you look through this, because the timeframes all merge into one another, you realize um, how much we've gone through over the last two years. But take a look at the result. I think when you look at the result and you say, okay, so, so by and large, and what we're looking at here is effectively the eligible, total eligible population. When you dive below the surface a little bit, um, I think it's significant. So certainly um, adults who have received their first dose are up there. 
Uh, the one area that I will say, certainly in the Hudson Valley that we're seeing an opportunity is really the five to 11 year olds. Uh, I think we, we we're continuing to focus on, on how to continue to raise that, that total number, uh, today being just about 32%. Um, and it is interesting when you talk to parents, right? There are lots of parents who are very comfortable taking a vaccine themselves, but a little bit more hesitant about giving a vaccine to their child. And so that's one of the things that we have to really begin to hone in on as, as, a, as a society and a community overall. But, but by and large, I would say that we're, we're doing a fantastic job and uh, really it's that younger population that we need to continue to focus in on. So here's the, as I like to say, here's the money shot, right? This is when you look at the time frame up until the end of this summer, this is what our hub, our vaccine hub has been able to accomplish with partnership with, with all of these community organizations and our county health departments. We were directly responsible for just over 2.5 million doses of vaccine to be distributed and allocated across the Hudson Valley. And when you look at that number um, and you think about the next number, so that's 662 doses that we have directly administered at WMC ourselves, not in the mass vaccination sites, but just doses that we gave, that we put in arms through our own pods, um, not including the boosters that you'll see below that, but the one column over, 566,000 doses that have been distributed and given through our mass vaccination sites. So from our perspective, again, from WMC Health's perspective, we have, if you just add it up quickly, about 1.2 million doses that we've directly administered needles into arms. Uh, again, without, I won't ask for a show of hands, but there are roughly 2.3 million people in the Hudson Valley. So I think from, as an organization, we're extraordinarily proud of the fact that chances are that many of you in this room and certainly others have been participants in a vaccine pod that we've helped administer. Um, when you look at the regional coordination, this is something that um, the teams that the, the small team that worked on the hub, the 44,000 doses redistributed. Um, it may not sound a lot, 44,000 doesn't sound like that big of a number, but what you're talking about is 24 seven staff monitoring phones so that when a provider calls and says, I have too much Pfizer and not enough Moderna, or I have no Moderna, but I have Pfizer, or I've got one dose left in the Pfizer and I don't want it to go to waste. Can you get me somebody down here tonight? That was us working the phones 24 seven, 365 basically, right? And, and trying to make sure that none of those doses got wasted. And that is, if, if, if all the numbers up here, that to me is probably the most astounding number because um, there are a lot of folks who didn't sleep trying to make sure that everybody got the dose that they needed. And then finally, the last piece is the health equity outreach. And this is work that continues today, but really looking at, again at whether it's the coach events, the pop-up clinics and other types of opportunities from a hub perspective, this sort of encapsulates the work that we've been involved in over the last, uh, the last year or so. So that brings us to phase five, and that's our current environment. Um, and I think when you look about, if you look at current state, right? Um, I don't know that if you were to talk to folks in November, I don't know here if you felt this way, but many folks thought, okay, we're, we're back Remember I said phase two in, in, in May of last year, early June, and we thought, oof, the worst of it's behind us. Well, I think November, this past November, many folks thought, ooh, the worst is behind us, right? And only to find that as we progressed into it, um, that obviously now where we stand, that, that isn't the case. And um, at this point, we've got, I think January 4th, we had about 1.8 million people who had COVID across the U.S., um, it's just a substantial number. Um, boosters this week, uh, or I should say last week, were approved for high-risk children from 5 to 11, and guidance continues to come out uh, almost certainly on a weekly basis, but sometimes even in more frequently. So this is not meant to be an eye exam, but if you look at the chart that you see up here, just really the point here is that the, the Omicron variant has now taken over Delta in, by, in, in large part, right? And we've begun to see a new spike, a new peak in terms of, of what that looks like. Uh, if we were to pull in the first peak, it's not quite as bad as where we were in March of, of, of when this started, but certainly it is a, a reason for caution. 
But the other thing that's important here, and, and, and Mike's gonna talk about this later, but think about our workforce. Think about our healthcare workers. In the first two waves, they were healthcare heroes. People had lawn signs. They were celebrating our healthcare heroes. Everybody was rah, rah, we're gonna fight this pandemic. Now people are just tired. People have, have decided, do I wanna to continue to be in nursing or in, in medicine? And you know, that's part of what we've been trying to work with our own workforce to say workforce resiliency is going to be that much more important. And, and that's something that, again, we'll touch on in a few minutes. But as we continue to look at these numbers, in addition to the impact to public health and our own operations within the hospital, the impact of our workforce is something that can't be understated in terms of, of a key condition. So this here is a, a trended line curve graph for the last year. These are all of our campuses, each of our hospitals across WMC Health. And what you'll see there, just total snapshot, one year network view, is that in the last you know, three weeks or so, you'll see that curve continue to go straight up, right? That the, this new variant and the hospital admissions uh, continue to grow in a post-holiday surge. Um, and when you think about it effectively post Thanksgiving all the way through to where we are today, that is just the, the overall snapshot. If you were to look at just WMC, Westchester Medical Center, this is three different line graphs. So the, the, the line at the bottom here, this line here is the start of COVID, right? And this took us through right here, right? This is the beginning and you see that spike and then it comes back down and kind of settles back in. What's interesting for us as we started looking at the planning aspect, and this is going to be true, I think, in the future, is if you looked at December of last year, right, which is effectively, you know, this blue curve, we, we, you started to see that even in December, that wave upticked, right? So one would think that as we started to look at this year, we would say, okay, if we are tracking year, week over week, that we could have expected the curve to climb in December. And it did. And if you look at where we are today, this is the first few weeks, right? This is the first bit of data that we have. It's pretty high. It's certainly not where we were, but it is high. And I think as you look at the, if you look at underneath the surface, and this is the part that you're starting to hear about a little bit more nationally. You know, this week we have on average, let's call it 163 COVID inpatients. But below that, 60% of those patients are non-symptomatic. They could be there for any number of other reasons. We have to test them, they show positive for COVID. Only 40% of the patients that are of that 163 are in the hospital for COVID and are symptomatic. So part of what we need to begin to understand from a public health and monitoring perspective is if we're going to continue to require all of our patients to be swabbed for COVID, what does that mean operationally as we start to look at all of our units? And what is the data that as we start reporting on it, What's most important? Is it total COVID data or is it data of symptomatic patients? Is it deaths? I think that's an important dialogue that we need to continue to have. This year, and this is my final slide, um, and I'll hand it back off to Mike. This year, we have an added wrinkle. And what you're looking up here on the screen is at flu, okay? The red line is the first couple of weeks of the flu season for this year. Now we had a little bit of an anomaly where, you know, as of like an hour ago, the state still hadn't updated the data for what happened this past week. But I went back 10 years. We've never had a flu season like we did up until this point. Okay, obviously last year there was no flu season because everybody was quarantined and wearing masks. But you'll see the last couple of seasons weren't as bad as well. So what you have is you have staffing constraints, you have COVID admissions, you have flu. So you have essentially what's creating a, a perfect storm in some ways for, from a health system perspective in managing operations. And so I think as you look at those conditions, um, and I wanna now hand it off to Mike, I think part of what we wanna address for the last piece of this is what are those things that we need to continue to focus on as a healthcare system when we track COVID moving forward? Excellent. 
Okay, so now ongoing considerations. What are we doing now and what do we have to look at and what are our, what are our plans going forward? Uh, we've, we've, we've been operating under pandemic conditions for two years uh, and we understand we're gonna do that for the foreseeable future. Again, with different, different pulls and uh, pushes on the system in terms of how many patients, uh, what the next variant uh, might look like. Uh, hopefully it will continue to weaken, but uh, you know, who knows with this. Um, so there are uh, a number of ongoing considerations we're looking at. Uh, the COVID tracking and herd immunity, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Workforce uh, and teaching, uh, grants and research and surge capacity. What we need to do from an organizational perspective is not have a situation ever occur again where we, uh, I think we're ahead of the curve and we create a six bed unit where within five weeks we'll have uh, you know, 240 COVID patients in house. And that's what we have to understand. So we now take a look at the COVID tracking. Um, you know, uh, currently, uh, we, we, we test all patients coming into the hospital, uh, which means is we pick up a lot of uh, asymptomatic uh, cases from patients that are seeking care from other, uh, for other ailments, uh, surgical patients, other inpatient care, et cetera. Uh, in the future, due to the prevalence of COVID, the question has to be asked, do we need to test? Do we really need to test everybody who comes in or only treat those patients who come in with COVID, symptomatic COVID, who need care for COVID, for COVID. And that's something that uh, they'll obviously work on now. Uh, you know, it's funny, I've been asked the question a lot, you know, how many COVID patients do you have uh, in the hospital? And I can give a number, but I have absolutely no clue as to whether or not they were, uh, they were really in for, really in for COVID. Uh, or whether they're and they're in for something else. Well, Governor Hoka last week uh, asked for a change in the way that we su uh, supply the information to the state. And I think for the first time, we'll really get some good numbers as to whether or not somebody who was labeled a COVID patient is really a COVID patient or they just have COVID and didn't know. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, was downstairs in the lab uh, the beginning of the week and I said, you know why, while I'm here, uh, can you, uh, can you uh, do an antibody test on me to see if I had co I've had COVID? And the answer was no, you don't, have, you don't have those antibodies. But again, if I would have been hospitalized for some reason, you know, who knows? So um, the other question is herd immunity. And are we, are we ever gonna be able to achieve herd immunity? Uh, different variants may, uh, may uh, uh, leave us, but how long, how long is, uh, you know, how long will uh, we get uh, other variants that COVID is going to be with us? The bottom line is we're going to have to figure out, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of figuring out how to live with it. But uh, yeah, I think everybody is looking for a more normalized uh, a more normalized society and getting back to doing everything that you want to do. Um, from a workforce, um, okay, thank you. Uh, from a workforce perspective, a uh, whole bunch of things that we're, we've dealt with uh, through this, uh, all the pressures that individual are, uh, are individuals under staff burnout, uh, setting up support programs for staff, uh, existing shortages, which, uh, which are really a, a problem within the system. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, things that are happening uh, at the medical center uh, with, uh, with the majority of our caregivers are, uh, are participants in the New York State pension plan because we are, the, the corporation is a New York State public authority, a public benefit corporation. Uh, because of that, people have always been hesitant to leave. 
because I will tell you that it is a very good, it is, uh, it is a very good defined benefit program for things that no employer can afford to do today. And uh, quite frankly, to be blunt, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Amble talked about when I first came. Uh, when I first came, I was used to an environment where benefits, benefits cost anywhere from maybe 24 to 27% of your gross salary number. The New York State pension program costs 28% of salary alone. Our benefits were 54% of payroll. And I will tell you that we were very competitive in the salaries we were paying. So it's not like, well, okay, you're doing that on a, on a depressed salary. Uh, no, it, it was not. Uh, that is, that, that we, we found ways to stabilize that over the years. But the bottom line is we don't see a lot of leakage. But what's happened in the region and what's happened around the country is that people have left the hospitals that they work at to go to work for agencies. Now, you always use agencies to some point, but the fact of the matter is where, uh, where uh, both the state and the federal government does not look uh, very well at people who are, I will say, taking advantage of shortages and jacking prices up. There was an article I read last week that there's a hospital in the Midwest that in order to staff how to go to an agency and the overtime rate for a nurse was $335 an hour. So the, the system, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but there is a discombobulation of the, of the system. And in addition to that, over the, next, um, over the next three years, there's going to be a need for 180,000 additional healthcare workers in the Hudson Valley alone. It's not near the Hudson Valley, 180,000. And we believe that uh, everything we've seen, 50% of that need will go unmet. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, teaching. Uh, I will just say that we value the relationship with New York Medical College and please, uh, both from a physician uh, and a, uh, all the other things, physical therapists, et cetera, et cetera, please keep, uh, keep, turning out, uh, keep turning out people who may wanna work in the medical center. We're very appreciative. Next, grants. I'll, I'll just say briefly that uh, we, we've received uh, just under $3 million uh, in, uh, grant money awarded to date, uh, federal grants, uh, state grants, um, uh, and uh, we're working with a number of corporate sponsors, Regeneron, Mayo, uh, NIH, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, oh, I see Duke Health there, that's nice. And uh, from, a, a, from a, research a research perspective, there are 38 active studies going on right now. Okay. Now, surge capacity, and this is, this is important, and I'll, uh, I'll basically uh, end, uh, end the presentation with this. We do not, we, we've got to try to understand what the future is going to look like and be able to accommodate uh, not only our patients, but be able to give our, our physicians, our nurses, the other clinicians, everyone, the appropriate environment to treat patients in. And I don't think anybody certainly can predict what the next, what the next uh, public health issue, I'll say, will be out there. And I, I will say that the, 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 the two people you have giving uh, uh, this uh, um, presentation this afternoon, neither Josh nor I are clinicians. And just a, a quick story, I came to a realization a number of years ago when I was, uh, when I was working at Duke. And uh, we had the snowstorm of the century, 24 inches. Uh, and I will tell you, an inch on the ground in North Carolina, uh, we want, I think we had two inches once school was out for a week. Uh, there's no, no salt, no plows, no nothing. So 
I, 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 I had a, a four wheel drive uh, vehicle and I got into the hospital and I went into the hospital in a sweater and jeans. And I went into the, uh, I went into the room where all the administrators were and everybody, everybody had a function. Everybody had a job except for me. So I sat in the back of the room and I watched and I figured, why don't I go be productive? So I said, okay, what am I going to do in the hospital? So I figure, ah, patients need to be fed. I go down the kitchen. So I went down to the kitchen and said, I'm here to volunteer. What can I do? And they sent me over to a really neat machine. I really had a good time. And I was baking bread, taking slices of bread out and putting it in and sealing it. And it was fun until the supervisor noticed that I was there and she threw me out of the kitchen. She said, you can't be doing this. Not the president of the hospital. Go do something else. So now I'm not qualified to do anything. So what did I do? I drove doctors, nurses, other clinicians home and back. And it was, I will say, probably the, fir uh, the first and the last time in my life I will be up for 54 hours straight. But I did nothing but drive. And I came to the realization, I'm not qualified to do anything. They won't even let me work in the kitchen. All, all I can do is be the CEO and drive. <laughs> the realization is that as management of the hospital, we are there to make sure that those that can do, can do. That they can provide the care. And we've done a lot of things. We signed a half billion dollar deal with Phillips uh, a few years ago, half billion dollars over 15 years. Uh, now we've brought all the other hospitals in and it's about $800 million. Uh, we're first in line for all the new technology. They create a new MRI, the old MRI goes out, the new one comes in. We're the first ones on the East Coast to get anything, anything they come up with. It's a wonderful deal. Again, making those that can diagnose and treat even better, giving them more clinical information. With this, the one thing I talked about earlier was the facilities. We're moving stuff back and forth. Uh, okay, patients are going. Okay, we're at the four south this week. We're converting. Send them over to the ambulatory ex ambulatory surgery center. We now know. We now know what our needs are. We need to be all private again because of because of all the deficits. You know, 15 years ago when people were starting to go all privates. It was all about patient experience. Now, patient experience factors in, but it's not patient ex experience. It's you with what goes on today. You can't have two people in a room. It does not make it does not make sense. And uh, to be blunt, over in Val over here uh, at the medical center, we have thirty five beds blocked every day because of the medical and social needs of the patient in the first bed. We can't use the second bed. It's ten percent. That's 10% of our volume right there. So what, what, are we, what are we doing? We know that we have to create an environment that can take care of more severely ill patients in terms of what may be out there for short or longer periods of time. We need to be able to increase our bed capacity when we realize it, or the state says, the governor said, I need you to increase 50%. I need you to increase 70%. How the heck do you do that? And we need, we need those ICU beds available and everything that goes on with ICU beds. So what are we going to do? We filed a certificate of need. Uh, this is a... Uh, this is a, a rendering, and in a minute, we'll show a, a little video, take you around the project. But this is a project that is going to come off of the front of the hospital, parallel to how the children's hospital goes out to Woods Road. Uh, it's a five-story building. The fifth floor will be a shell right now. 
uh, three, uh, uh, the first floor will be a, a conference center and mechanicals. Two, three, and four will be 32 bed units. It will be a relocation of a number of our ICU beds. We have a number of ICU beds in the 1977 tower for various reasons don't need code today. Uh, natural light, there were some other things that didn't exist in 1977 that exist today. So we can't renovate, we can't do anything for those beds. We will eventually build out the fourth floor that will give us uh, that'll give us 128 private rooms. All of those rooms, except uh, a handful, which will be positive pressure rooms, all of those rooms will have the ability to go to negative pressure, which is really important, especially in a pandemic situation. Um, all of those rooms have the infrastructure to become ICU rooms. There'll be step-down rooms and there'll be ICU. And I think most people know, and in Valhalla, we do almost no primary and secondary care. It's all tertiary and quaternary care. So the fact of the matter is our quote unquote step-down patients in most hospitals, they'd be ICU patients. So the ability to convert that. We are not asking the state to increase our license. So what we will be doing is we'll be decanting the 1977 tower. All of those rooms will become private. So when the project is done, 100% of the rooms in the medical center will now be private rooms. So that's step one. Step two, they've all, we're about 80% through renovating the entire 1977 tower. One of the things that will remain there is all the infrastructure for the second bed. The gases will be there, the head wall will be there. It'll be a nice sitting room. But in case of a pandemic, you roll out the sofa, you call Hill Rom, send in 128 additional beds. And we've immediately created a situation, rooms that are semi-private today will become semi-private again. And without having to move patients into the ambulatory care center here, there immediately. So we are, what we are, have said in that CON is this is your first pandemic ready project. This is something that's geared to creating an environment where patients who come in with whatever can be treated in the right environment by the clinicians and give the clinicians the ability to treat the patients to their maximum capacity. You want to, uh, so this is, this is the basic, again, medical center here. And this is, this is the new project and you see how it, how it comes, how it comes out to the street. So will that be taking up part of your very little. We'll we'll lose we'll lose a bit, but not not an enormous amount. In Children's Hospital over here, you know, at one point in time, we looked at putting it off of the back of the ambulatory care pavilion, but you know, in terms of planning, ten years ago, we did almost no ambulatory care at the medical center due to the nature of it. We now have a large ambulatory care building. What is the most reasonable space to expand that building five years from now, 10 years from now? It's the plot right behind it and connect the two buildings and you essentially double the size of the building. So when we eliminated that, we decided to go out front and we think it's a very, uh, we think it's a very uh, handsome building and will be very, very, very practical. Uh, and uh, we are looking at, uh, we're looking at breaking ground uh, on that, uh, hopefully, uh, to start some of the uh, infrastructure work this summer. Uh, those of you may have read uh, the supply chain, especially for things like steel, uh, has just gone through the roof. So 
we've got to, uh, we're doing some value engineering of the project now, and we've got to see uh, what we can do to get some reasonable pricing on steel. But that building is programmed to open up in probably the third quarter of 2024. And uh, we'll, we'll put us and uh, we'll put the people who depend on us for care in a, uh, in a very good position. So uh, that is, uh, in essence, the presentation. So we're parking deck. No, no. We have, uh, you, you know, we, we've, we've got the deck in the back. The problem, the problem with decks is it is incredibly costly and if if you ask me where do i want to spend money i want to spend money on a parking deck i also don't want to i also don't want a black top over green and but we've taken a look we've taken a look at the parking you know we we've we've got a parking lot what is that number two is that one on the right hand side as you come in yeah parking lot one has essentially been, now the ambulatory care pavilion is not totally built out. We still have three floors left to build out in that. Uh, and uh, pretty soon we should, pretty soon we should start on, uh, on five. But um, even when, even when the ACP is full, there will be, there will be available parking in there. Uh, and I, I will tell you that we're really not concerned, remember, even though this takes up, even this, this takes out a few rows of parking, uh, A, we have excess, and B, except for a pandemic, we're not expanding our license number of beds. So theoretically, we're taking care of the same number of patients. Should there be a pandemic? Well, there's no visitors. So, uh, and, and ambulatory care goes down because I'm going to stay away from that place. So that's, that's where we are. I think we'll be, I think we'll be fine. Parking has been described as the third rail of all building management in New York, but uh, I won't go any farther than that. As long as I can get a parking space, I don't worry about it. Uh, one of our, we'll get to uh, Dr. Ansel in a minute. One of our, and thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Both of you, thank you very, very much. Outstanding. Well, thanks Remember, for Remember, from now on, everybody, anytime you drive by a hospital, but especially this one, uh, don't just drive by. Think of what is going on in there and what has gone on to make that place present, effective, and effective into the future. Uh, the planning, the strategy, the operations, but also the responsibility to make this really work because no matter where you are if you have a bad accident in the middle of the night on a rainy day rainy night you know there is a warm freshly made bed waiting for you someplace especially at westchester medical center if you're unfortunately uh, uh, have your accident uh, here in the hudson valley or fortunately because you'll be brought here and you'll have a better chance of survival. Uh, one of our uh, online participants uh, is asking, what role does the hospital's emergency management program play in all of this? And thank you for your question. It's, it's I, I mean, it's, a, it's integrally, well, I'm dry. Uh, it is intimately involved. Diet Coke, please, please bring up a Diet Coke. Thanks, Josh. Uh, it's it's part it's part of the process. We have a uh, we we have a really good disaster management team internally, and they are you know they're they're a key. Uh, everybody we 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 try to be we try to be more inclusive uh, if we can. Uh, obviously, because there are people who come into the room that have really good ideas as to how we can do stuff. And uh, as I said at the beginning. Uh, this was a learning. This was a real learning experience for everything, uh, for everybody. Excuse me. One one thing I would like to mention. One of the things that I, I was actually um, uh, amazed and proudest. Uh, we we've got a group of uh, we've got a group of young administrators. Um, 
my def my definition of young might necessarily not might not necessarily be theirs, but uh, uh, Josh is young, but these are even younger. Uh, sorry, Josh. Uh, hopefully, your daughter's not listening. Uh, but uh, um, we, you know, at the very beginning, we started to look at at models, and I read an article one morning about uh, in Korea where they were doing the uh where they were doing the uh mobile the mobile testing you know pull up you open up the window and we do so i i called anthony costello um and uh our coo and i said why don't you see if you can get tents or something and he got those two huge huge tents that were up there for a long time and the entire program was put together by these by these junior administrators, directors, and some v VPs. Um, and it was amazing. And I'd wake up in the morning, you turn the news on, and you hear in New Jersey, not that there's anything wrong with Jersey, <laughs> but in, in Jersey, at the very beginning, people were lining up at 4.30 in the morning to get tested. Uh, and they ran out of supplies by 7.30 in the morning and people couldn't get tested. And then I'd look at the Oval and the system, the operational system that they set up, call in, you make an appointment, you come in within 15 minutes, what they did. And we would sometimes go out and just get in line, just pull the car up and see how long it took. It never took us more than 20 minutes to be able to get in and operate it all day. And to me, it was absolutely, it was absolutely amazing. So from that perspective, you, you exclude no one because people that you might not think can have any ideas have better ideas than you have. Terrific. And uh, Dr. Ansel, you have a question. I have a rather dry question. But first I wanted to a dry question. question. This was an outstanding presentation and a real treat during these times to be here. Truly a Dean's Distinguished uh, presentation tonight. Uh, my question is about budgeting and about <laughs> forecasting. Uh, many of us in public health have been somewhat brainwashed over the past 10 years about hospitals decreasing bedding and everything moving out into the community. And I'm just wondering above and beyond the initial um, building the hospital and the fundraising and the grant development. How do you keep this going? How do you budget? How do you plan? Where does going to single beds, where does this, is this higher reimbursement rates from insurance no. companies? Where no. does this come from? We, we operate, uh, and I, I will say something, that the board, um, the, the board at Westchester, it's it's a model that I've not seen before because of the fact there there were there are four public benefit corporations uh, that deliver health care in the state. All of us have different enabling legislations, which basically says the rules are different for all of us because it was it was a political process that they went through in terms of negotiating these. Our board is composed of 19 members. 15 voting members, four non-voting members. I'm on the board. I'm a non-voting member by virtue of my position. Uh, I will say voting at the medical center, uh, being a voting or a non-voting member really doesn't matter because this summer I'll be here for 17 years and we've had two votes in 17 years that have not been unanimous. And those votes have been 14 to one. I won't bring any, uh, eight to seven, eight to seven, you lose, you lost half the board. This is not politics where 55% 40 is a landslide. No, you, so every, every board member is appointed a different way. Mm -hmm. President of the New York State Senate has an appointment to our board, the county, some the board of legislators through the county executive. Some of those George signs off on. Some have to go to the governor. There's all, everybody has a different path to the board. I'll tell you, in the entire time I've been there, no one has acted in a way other than their fiduciary responsibility to the hospital. I tell you that because 
places I've worked in the past, and I've worked at some large places and, you know, not be, 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 I was at St. Luke's Texas Heart, I was at Duke, I was at Northwell, and before Texas Heart, I was at uh, one of the large UPMC hospitals in Pittsburgh. So I've spent my career working at large institutions. You'd swear at a board meeting you were working for a venture capital firm. I was once told, I was once told by a board member that I was, I was, I was um, uh, not creating value by a program that we were doing that would lose money. I was destroying value and I could not have, I could not have disagreed more. This board, more than any board I've ever realized, I would tell you that if we told them, and we, we try to budget, cash is important, mm -hmm. but from a budgetary perspective, we try to budget five, $10 million surplus. That's, if the board said, I want a $50 million surplus, well, we could probably do it. But that would mean cutting back programs that were important. Our concept is, Take everything you do, throw it in a pot, and if what comes out is not red, you're okay. Proceed. So in terms of putting budgets together, I'm not going to say that everybody zero bases their areas every year, but number one, we, the way we budget, we don't allow creep. You've got to, you've got to justify what you've had. And that is really important. So that's, you know, some areas do get zero base. Take it apart, put it together, show us what you're doing. But from a programmatic perspective, if, if we told the board at the beginning of the year, we're going to make $10 million, and we made 30, I can assure you there'd be no parade for me. There would be questions as to why didn't you invest that money in the community? That's one of the reasons. My longest stint, I was at Duke for 10 years. I'm here for 17 years. Uh, the fact of the matter is, this is without a doubt the best job that I've ever had. A, it's the most rewarding because of the situation we were in 17 years ago. But the reality is that the board here really cares about delivery of service to the community and making sure you do that. So, you know, you, you try to cut out waste. You hire very, very, very good reimbursement people. You hire very, very, very good people who understand managed care and can negotiate contracts. I mean, I could get into that for an hour, some of the things. The contracts, the, the rates don't matter. What matters is what's buried in the contract because that's how they pay you. And that's what we did. We went out and we looked for expertise in certain areas uh, because a medical center, the medical center, the, to put in perspective, uh, this is a great story. I probably shouldn't tell it, but I will because you got me talking. Um, this the, session is the, recorded, by that's the way, fine. just a reminder. I don't care. I don't <laughs> care. Uh, they're just looking for an excuse. Now, uh, the three and a half years before the management team that we assembled in 2005 came, the medical center lost a quarter of a billion dollars over those three and a half years. Uh, I don't know how. I'll just leave it at that. So the first full year, uh, Gary Brudnicki, who's our, uh, our uh, senior executive VP, he's the COO and CFO of the system. It's an interesting combination, but it was done for a reason. The first full year we were there, which was 2006, we had a $63 million surplus. The second year we were there, we had a $78 million surplus. Now, again, our drive was to, and that's with adding an additional 250 nursing positions. We just, the attitude is, if you can't do it well, don't do it. I'm not going to run a half-assed hospital or a half-assed program. If you can't do it, don't do it. Because regardless of what LeapFrog tries to do or any of these organizations, you're dealing with uninformed consumers. 
They don't understand and will never understand what goes on in a hospital. For a lot of people, a hospital is a hospital. We have a 15 bed critical access hospital up in Margaretville. We have the facility down here. There are a lot of people who can't tell the difference in terms of what we do. But the bottom line is, I was on the board of the Greater New York Hospital Association at the time. And I go in and Ken Rasky, who's the president, said, we, we have somebody from the American Hospital Association here and wants to talk to you. And she says, we've seen what you've done there. We want to do a case study. We'd love to do a case study. And I, 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 I remember I said to her, I said, when I was at Duke, the first first thing we had to address was the, and I went to Duke in 1993. So uh, Stanford had sort of crashed for a period of time, managed care out on the West Coast. It was coming East. The three-year financial projections looked bad and we had to do a huge project at Duke. Went out, went great. Harvard School of Public Health uh, did a case study of it. And it was great. It got to go up to, got to, go up to, uh, to Boston, got to uh, you know, defend it. They had a whole audience of, and it was really a very neat experience and I really enjoyed it. So she said, we'd like to do it here. So she's the person from the AHA said, I'd like to do a case study. I said, nope. She said, why not? I said, look, there is nobody, there is no manager out there who's good enough to take an organization from losing a quarter of a billion dollars to immediately making 130, $140 million over two years. People talk about low hanging fruit. We were stepping on it. We were tripping, we were tripping over it. I said, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing the way things are run. So our first, the first thing we did is let's put good management in place especially hospitals. I remember at the time, all of the medical comedies on TV uh, and seeing uh, the CEO who was the biggest buffoon uh, on the face of the earth. That was the feeling of a lot of, that was the feeling of a lot of people. You've got to put good people, everybody, everybody's important, everybody has their function. It was putting the right people in place and determining what the priorities of, of the organization. And quite frankly, there were some programs, there were some programs we just got to, it's making investments. Because wouldn't you rather have five great programs than 10 mediocre programs? And that's really what we did. Again, that was a very, very long-winded answer. Please tell me I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> great, great answer. Great I get, answer. I get lost Thank in that. Uh, no, you can no, this, this was great. I was writing this all down. <laughs> it's on tape. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, Josh, I think you had a comment as well. No, no. okay. Then um, we're over to uh, someone else here in the studio audience. Uh, who is that? Uh, Attractive woman, doctor. Oh, I'm not allowed to say that anymore. <laughs> Dr. Sherlita Amler. Thank you. So, first of all, I owe you guys two thank yous. And the first one is uh, for um, the Westchester County Center, uh, which you guys did such a beautiful job with. And people always thought that it was the county health department running that. And so I would get these glowing emails and I would write back and say, you really need to thank Mike Israel and Westchester Medical Center because of the people doing it, but you did a stellar job. And the emails that I would get would be that the operation was flawless. And having been there myself a couple of times, I think that is a true definition that you guys did a flawless job of that. So I would say congratulations on the success that that was. Secondly, I want to thank you for your work on the hub as a member, as a represent one of the representatives of Westchester on the hub. I thought that Josh and his team did an outstanding job and because of their efforts, vaccine reached the providers in a timely, effective manner and the ability to move vaccine within uh, the Hudson Valley was again, I think a pretty flawless operation. And I think because of that, we were able to maximize the number of people that did receive a vaccine. So I think on both, on both fronts, you, you really deserve kudos. 
And my question is that I think that COVID has demonstrated the importance of local health departments partnering with hospitals on these type of events. And since hospitals and local health departments in New York really have very little communication on a regular, in a regular world, I mean, you know, uh, hospitals are regulated by New York State Department of Health, which most people don't understand, and that local health departments really have very little to do with their local hospitals. I wonder how you, what your opinion is as to how we can continue to mentor and grow the relationships that has developed over the last two years between the local health department and the hospitals, including Westchester Medical Center, because I think these relationships have enabled us to do miraculous things over the last two years. And so I just wonder, you know, what's your opinion? How can we keep what we have gained from, you know, withering on the vine once this is over? Yeah, I'll just say a couple things and I'll let, uh, I'd like Josh to comment also. Um, I, I will say that the, uh, it, it will be easier to maintain the, uh, it'll be easier to maintain the relationships with say uh, hospitals and health departments than it will be with the uh, exemplary uh, cooperation between hospitals that uh, Josh talked about. We got, a, we got an award from the uh, County Association um, and the, the medical center got an award for what, uh, what we did during the pandemic. And one of the things I said was, uh, I've never in my life seen, uh, I've never in my life seen co hospitals cooperate and the goodwill between hospitals. But I think we, I think we've come to the realization that they are, uh, we unfortunately are com competitors. We don't, uh, uh, we're run by, uh, we're run by humans who, uh, especially, uh, you know, when the average tenure of a hospital CEO is three years, uh, I guess personal, personal, uh, uh, concern, uh, may trump, uh, you know, the cooperation, but I, I hope it continues. I know our relationships are better with even those that were not great in the past, but in terms of health departments, there's no reason why there should not be. There should not be constant communication and understanding what uh, what the what the county health department perceives the needs to be, along with the hospital. You know, and I think one of the things is, uh, you know, Westchester Westchester is lucky that we're you know we are uh, we are a New York State municipal authority. And, you know, I explained about the board, uh, the board, the board does not pressure. I feel, I, you know, uh, it may be because outside of the COVID year where you can't make heads or tails of the financials because you lost all this revenue coming in from patient care, but you got all this revenue some, was lo some were loans, some were grants from the federal government. The financials make absolutely no sense from that. But in a normal year, uh, the direction I get from the board is invest, invest in the community, invest in the organization so we can do the things we need to do. Uh, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be working together because we both, we're both after the same thing. And I think our relationships have been great. I do hope that both the state and federal government will continue to support public health efforts for hospitals, for local health departments, because after 9-11, there was lots of money. And then that quickly dr dried up. And the local health departments have been decimated over the the, the, the years since then. So I'm hopeful that they will learn from this, that there needs to be infrastructure, both at the local hospital level, the local health department level, and that they'll, they'll work to continue these relationships. And Josh, do you care to add some comments? Sure. Um, so twofold. I think one, what would previously be considered, I guess, private public partnerships, in this case, because we're public, public, public partnerships, um, what we found is that the work that we've been doing already, whether it's through vaccine or testing or others, that's going to continue. So part of what our team is looking at right now is how to continue to work with 
with the county health departments across the Hudson Valley to make sure that whether it's future pandemic readiness or even just the existing pandemic that we're in, that we have the ability to continue to explore those partnerships, whether it's through mobile health or, or, other, um, or other opportunities through occupational health. Um, the other piece of it that is interesting that, that Mike was mentioning about a new building, you know, you were mentioning about budgets, right? So for the last 15 years from the Burger Commission on, right, it was all about reducing beds and shrinking infrastructure. This building project, the way we're, we're positioning it with the state is that it's, we are the Hudson Valley receiver of over 10,000 transfers a year without a pandemic. It's not that every community hospital needs to expand capacity to be ready for a pandemic. What we're saying is between our own 10 hospitals and the existing network that we have of all the other Hudson Valley hospitals and our partnerships with the health department, having that flexible infrastructure gives the state, frankly, and from a public health infrastructure perspective, the ability to expand and contrast without putting financial strain on the whole system. And that by continuing that type of relationship where we say as a hub, we can not only receive trauma and transfers and also administer vaccine, but we can also flex up and be ready for that next available. Like we did with, you know, pick some, Ebola, AIDS, Spanish flu, you know, so I think that's that partnership with the county health departments is a requirement and will continue to, to move forward. Well said. Yeah. Our uh, school program in public health, as people here know, has a close relationship with all of the county health departments in the Hudson Valley, and then some, including uh, Nassau, Broome County, and some others. So, no, no, I'm okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from online. Uh, one of my personal great mentors, Dr. Lenny Newman, is asking, is the cooperative effort with other hospitals and healthcare systems continuing? Will it revert to pre-COVID competitiveness? Sort of a... Um, addendum sort of to the last discussion. Uh, Lenny, uh, yes, and I hope not. <laughs> Good answer. I'm looking for any hands here in the room, not seeing any. I think we may have one more. It's not a question, it's a comment. Shall I uh, read it? It depends. <laughs> this is actually from one of our most fantastic professors in the basic sciences. And he just has a comment. He says, being from Brooklyn myself, I love this guy. I think he's referring to you. And now they're... <laughs> and thank, now there's... Thank you. <laughs> he says, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now there's another uh, question just came in. It says, you mentioned a major deficit in the number of healthcare professionals in the Hudson Valley from your perspective where should our school consider expanding our educational programs to meet their needs? We currently train masters in public health, doctorates in public health, physical therapists, speech language pathologists, and we also have a program in bioethics. Should we expand to include other areas of medical health care? Well, uh, you, you, uh, well, the School of Public Health and obviously uh, the obviously the medical school. Uh, we we love the physicians coming out. We love the PTs. We love that. I would tell you, nursing, um, nursing is a nursing is an issue, and um, they you know nursing to a large extent. There are a lot of nurses who are who are aging out. Um, and that is a, that is a real issue and is going to be a real issue, especially with the aging of the population, um, going forward, I would say that, uh, what, what lab, uh, lab, certainly lab techs is, uh, is a real, uh, is a real issue. Um, yeah, I, you know, we, we could, uh, uh, what? I would say tele also just to not necessarily specific to a profession, but so much of what we've seen with telehealth and being able to deliver Sorry. telehealth programs for all types of professionals, right? So if you're training to, to treat a patient in front of you versus treating a patient remotely, tele is here to stay. So that's one of those, I think, opportunities point. for the school. That's a very good point. And we've got, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, we have an incredible telehealth center uh, that... Uh, 
uh, has been not not only not only did it help us considerably uh, with uh, uh, with with COVID uh, with taking care of COVID patients, but uh, it was it was implemented to it was implemented for us to wire up all of the ICUs across the health network. And it was wired up, not as some organizations use it to reduce staffing. Our perspective was it's, it's another layer. It's another layer of care uh, where, uh, quite frankly, uh, they can buzz in whenever they want to buzz in because they're following all of the, all of the uh, 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 vitals and everything of the patient. But a family member, if they, if they can't get a doctor or a nurse in immediately, can actually hit the button in the room and they'll come in and they'll start to work with the patient. They let the staff know if they see something, if they see something going wrong. The best, the best presentation I saw with, with the telehealth center, which was great, uh, a snapshot of vitals may look like the patient is fine. But understanding the problem that the patient has, those what appear to be a, a fine snapshot may not be a fine snapshot. The patient could be crashing or whatever. And you've got healthcare professionals monitoring every, every uh, patient. We also, we also do things for other hospitals. We, uh, we have uh, an installation up at Orange Regional uh, in, uh, in the the stroke, we monitor their stroke patients up there. So there's a lot of stuff that goes. And yeah, I would tell you that would be, uh, you know, that would also, that's a good idea. I agree with you about lab tests too. It's very difficult to get lab technicians. And because patients are data quite rigorous. And so uh, that's a very, uh, that's an area where it's very hard to get adequate. Well, we were able to get during during the beginning of the pandemic. We were able to get help from the uh, from the medical school. Yeah. So that is uh, going to end up being the last word, but not quite. Uh, Fiona is going to help me with something very important. I, I would also like I, I I would like to thank you for inviting me, and I'd like to thank the the individual from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was just guessing, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, President Michael Israel, we appreciate your insightful words, uh, but especially the ongoing collaborative relationship with you, your mission, and your fine institution. So, please accept this plaque, which commemorates your lecture this afternoon. And may you always remember with pleasure the valuable time with us at New York Medical College. With pleasure. Thank you. Thank so you, Dr. Amler.